Okay. Welcome to Nailing It Down here at Varmblog. And we're taking a break from our series on the Gretha program because I think we need some more context on other programs, um, which is what I'm going to take time to do. You will notice that I tend to alternate between my long series on the Gretha, uh, the critique of the Gretha program, and its uh, importance in reception history, uh, in State and Revolution, and Korsh, and Daniel de Leon. We can see that it was an important text for most of the left wing of the communist movement, but we can also see that it was crucial for setting up, say, the stagist view of the Soviet constitution, and it was also the context for arguments in the debates in China in the 1960s and 70s, as we'll come to see. Uh, and it's contested today. But we need to look at the Erfurt program for two reasons. One, the Erfurt program really was the operational program of the SP Day. It was replaced later on. Um, the Görlitz program was one of the things that eventually replaced it, as we talked about with Bernstein leading the way there after his Lasalle in turn when he re-enters the SP Day in the nineteen in the late 19 teens after the war. Um, also, this leads to what the, a book by Kotsky called the class struggle, which uh, has often been criticized as vulgar Marxism are the Marxism of the second international, I think unfairly. Um, but it's important to remember that Kotsky and Babel were, were actually more read and, dis and distributed by socialists in the 19th century and up to uh, uh, the 1914, then Marx was himself. So this was the operate understanding of socialism for a good bit of the early 20th century and late 19th century. The Erfurt program's particular context is also interesting. Bismarck resigned, and that, that actually triggered the end of the anti-socialist laws, which allowed the party to open uh, publicly. Somewhere in this time period, it seems like the Lasallian faction had been somewhat marginalized and no longer needed to be um, uh, placated to stay in the coalition in the SP Day. This allowed the SP Day to state its aims more openly and lead to the beginning of a program. And this is what it is. Ingalls endorsed this program, but also critiqued it. And that dialectic is a little bit hard to understand. Uh, the critiques of the Erfurt program are not quite as strong as the critiques of the Goethe program from Marx and Engels, but we do know that there were elements of it he was quite uncomfortable with and wrote letters to Kowski about. We also know that the Erfurt program's adoption is when Engels decided to make uh, Marx's marginal notes on the draft program of Goethe um, publicly available in, in print. So it was important enough that as part of both an imminent critique and an endorsement of the Erfurt program, that the insufficiencies of the Goethe program's draft notes and probably even the compromises that remained after the language was changed. We'll get into the historical around that on the critique of the Goethe program series um, to be known to the public. Now, today we're going to read the Goethe program itself together. And we're also, like I said, going to read a contextual piece by Mike McNair. I'm also going to be giving my own commentary as we go for things that maybe we should notice in this program. Um, for those of you who want the history of the other programs, there's the program of the IWA, the International Working Men's Association of First International. There's the, the left party program of the French Marxist, of the OP program, which Marx spoke more highly of than the Goethe one. And there will be other programs we have to deal with uh, as we go. Um, so let's just keep that in mind. This is effectively replaced by what is often called the ABCs of communism or the 1918 Bolshevik program. And this was also a model for the programs of other Marxist and socialist parties around the world 
uh, some of those programs we may also go through in this series. All right. Uh, let's get into the Goethe program. This is the Thomas Dunlap translation, which is available for free on Marxist.org. I will also include the links in the show note. Uh, remember, this was written primarily by Bernstein, Kalski, and Babel. Uh, although Lemnet popularized it, it doesn't seem to have a hand in writing it. Okay. The economic development of bourgeois society inevitably leads to the ruin of small business. So we have this tendency towards centralization that we've also seen in other work by Engels. This is assumed in this time period, which is based on the private ownership by the worker of his means of production. So petty bourgeois here actually here refers to people who have almost no or very few employees. All right. So small businesses here means, you know, like artisan enterprises, people who don't employ a lot of people, people who do whole piece work, etc. It separates the worker from his means of production and turns him into a propertyless proletarian. While the means of production become the monopoly of a relatively small number of capitalists and large landowners. This is the... Um, minority of the privileged few that Madison wanted to defend in the Federalist Papers. Hand in hand with the monopolization of the means of production goes the displacement of these fractured small businesses by colossally large enterprises. The development of the tool into the machine, the gigantic growth of the of productivity of human labor. So we see here the assumption of centralized industrial capital and beginnings of Taylorism as the assumed form of capital that the social Democrats are dealing with. By all the benefits of this transformation are monopolized by capitalists and large landowners. For the proletariat and the sinking middle classes, the, pe the petty bourgeois and farmers, I guess here we mean peasants and sharecroppers, unclear. I need to look at the German. Uh, it means an increase in the insecurity of their existence, of misery, of pressure, of oppression, of degradation, and of exploitation. So we don't, even though uh, the proletariat is seen as a prime mover of history, we see a kind of willingness to admit that the petty bourgeois and small proprietary farmers and subsistence farmers and, you know, etc. kind of have it rough too, and most of them are going to be forced in the proletariat as they get gobbled up by larger corporations, our businesses at this time. They weren't all corporations. All right. The gulf between the proper... Oh, excuse me. Even, even greater becomes a number of proletarians. Asterisk. This is the source of the revisionist debates. Is the lack of the number of, prolet of industrial proletarians in specific, uh, according to Bernstein. Um, in the early 20th century... But in this time, they say we're going to see more and more teeming proletariat, even more massive, the army of excess workers. So we see people who are not proletariats, but who are in the proletariat as excess workers, but do not have work. So what we might call a precariat or the semi lumpenized, et cetera. There's lots of words used in Marxism for this. And even more stark, the opposition between the exploiter and the exploited, ever more bitter, the class struggle between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat which divides modern society into two hostile camps and constitutes the common characteristics of all industrialized countries. The gulf between the property and the property list, and here we've already seen property defined as um, productive capital, not personal property. It refers to land and things that you can use to build things. Um, the gulf between the property and the property list is further widened by the crisis that are grounded in the nature of the capitalist mode of production. Crises that are becoming more extensive and more devastating that elevate this general uncertainty into a normal state of society and furnish proof that the powers of productivity have grown beyond society's control. That The private ownership of the means of production have become incompatible with their appropriate application for development, a.k.a. because they're held privately and people need to make private stockpiles. People are wasteful and also don't share, and it becomes a source of misery and an alienation when it should be because of the productivity it provides a source of reduced labor and more happiness. Uh, 
The private ownership of the means of production, once the means for securing for the producer and the ownership of his product, have today become the means for expropriating farmers, artisans, and small merchants, and for putting non-workers, capitalists, large landowners, into possession of the product of the workers. You will notice here that workers and proletariat are exactly interchangeable in Kotsky. Only the transformation of the capitalist private ownership of the means of production Land and soil, pits and mines, raw materials, tools, machines, means of transportation, and just social property. So we have here the talk of social property, not nationalized property. We have here this focus on on uh, critique. Uh, but we also have here basically what we mean by property. And it's not like whether or not you can have a house or have a book. It's it's whether or not you can have things that enable you to make other things and claim sole right to them. And the transformation of the production of goods and the socialist production carried on by and for society can cause large enterprise and the constant growing productivity of social labor to change for hitherto exploited classes from a source of misery and oppression into a source of the greatest welfare and universal harmonious perfection. That's an interesting big promise but we also see here some of the mirroring of the rhetoric of the prologue to the communist manifesto this social transformation amounts to the emancipation not only of the proletariat but of the entire human race which is suffering from current conditions but it can only be the work of the working class because all other classes notwithstanding conflicts of interest between them stand on the ground of the private ownership of the means of production and have their common interest the goal of preservation of the foundations of contemporary society most people own land and they want to keep it the struggle of the working class against capitalist exploitation is necessarily a political struggle without political whites the working class cannot carry its economic struggles and develop its economic organization it cannot bring about the transfer of the means of production in the procession of the community without first having obtained political power this is the task of the social democratic party to shape the struggle of the working class into a conscious and unified one and to point out the inherent necessity of its goals so class consciousness here means consciousness of your unity as a class. It doesn't mean anything special to send it from on high as it does some in some rhetoric later. The inherent interests of the working class are the same in all countries with the capitalist mode of production. With the expansion of global commerce and the production for the world market, the position of the worker in every country becomes increasingly dependent of the position of the workers in other countries. That's still true, peeps. The emancipation of the working class is thus the task in which workers of the civilized countries are all equally involved. This is why 1914 was such a big deal. Recognizing this, the, the German Social Democratic Party feels and declares itself to be one with the class conscious workers of all other countries. The German Social Democratic Party, therefore, does not fight for a new class privileges and class rights, but for the abolition of a class rule and of classes themselves for equal rights and equal obligations for all without distinction of sex or birth. Starting from these views, it fights not only exploitation and the oppression of Wayne Ogers and society today, but every manner of, it, of exploitation and oppression, whether directed against a class, a party, a sex, uh, sex or race. So all those people who think that, that that stuff's later edition, that's liberalism added to the SP day, it's there this early. It's there in 1891, motherfuckers. Proceeding from these principles of German Social Democratic Party demands, first of all, one, universal, equal, and direct suffrage from secret ballot in all elections for all citizens of the Reich over the age of 20. That's actually interesting. Without distinction of sex. So they're calling for, although they don't actually achieve a universal suffrage even of women. In 1891, that's a big deal. Not even all socialists at the time supported that. Not even all female socialists at the time supported that. All right. Proportional representation, and until this is introduced, legal distribution of electoral districts after every census. So no more gerrymandering. Two-year legislative periods. The holding of elections on legal holiday, 
compensation for elected representatives, suspension of every restriction on political rights, except in case of legal incapacity. You will hear this stuff called liberal today, but the SPA day was not liberal this early. Uh, we see here basically things that progressives demand today. Holding of elections on le on legal holidays. We don't do that in America. Proportional representation. We've gotten worse and worse at that. Legal distribution of electoral differences to every census. We only do it every 10 years. I guess that's when there's a census, but we do it in a really strange way where it's done by state legislatures, et cetera, et cetera. Universal, equal, and direct su and suffrage with secret ballot, which is something that many later socialists abandon um, after 1918 and revisions to the Soviet structure. Um, early on, the SPA Day and all these parties actually support secret ballot. All right, there's some other things, though, that people... Direct legislation by the people through the rights of proposal and rejection, self-determination of self-government of people in the right, state, province, and municipality. So there's actually strong local governments here, guys. Election by the people of magistrates who are answerable and liable to them. Annual voting of taxes. Oh, everyone, I mean... And that sounds like old progressivism, not current liberalism. That's interesting. Education of all to bear arms. Militia in place of a standing army. That's also an old liberal demand, later abandoned. Determination by popular singly on questions of war and peace, uh, which is what we were supposed to have in the United States, but is undone by the War Powers Act. Um, but that's actually in a liberal position. Settlement of all international disputes by arbitration. So the beginning of international law. Abolition of all laws that place women at disadvantage compared with men uh, matters of public or private law. So women be able to own property. Well, except not property the way we think about it. Abolition of all laws that limit or suppress freedom of expression or restrict or suppress the right of association and assembly. Now, it's funny how many leftists today will call this liberal. This is our foundational document in a lot of ways. The declaration that religion is a private matter. Uh, that, that's interesting. Abolition of all expenditures from public funds for ecclesiastical and religious purposes. We don't give money to churches. Ecclesiastical and religious communities are to be regarded as private associations and regulate their own affairs entirely autonomously. Also, this would imply they were taxed. In the United States, we do some of this and not all of this. The secularization of schools, which we do, but Europe largely doesn't. Compulsory attendance to public school of the Volksschule, extended elementary school, to about ninth grade. Free education, free educational materials and free meals in the public Volksschule, Volksschulen, as well as the higher educational institutions for those of boys and girls considered to be qualified for further education by virtue of their abilities. So testing in and it's free. So free college, free compulsory school, free meals at school. For everyone, they're not means tested because we're not aiming to do that. Free administration of justice and free legal assistance administered by the law by judges elected by the people. Appeals in criminal cases. Compensation for individuals unjustly accused in prisons or sentenced. Abolition of capital punishment. Again, look here. We're calling for everyone being in a militia, but also abolition of capital punishment. And I don't think that's a contradiction. Free medical care, including midwifery and, me and medicines and free burial. Graduated income and property tax for defraying all public expenditures. Now, this is, remember, these are the immediate, these are the immediate demands and the task of the party now. This isn't even the long-term goals. Uh, Graduated income and property tax for defraying all public expenditures to the extent that they are paid for by taxation. Inheritance tax graduated according to the size and the inheritance and degree of kinship. So we're going to hit the inheritance taxes. Abolition of all indirect taxes, customs, or other measures that sacrifice the interests of the community to those of a privileged few. So fuck protectionism. Again, people need to read this to understand what socialists historically believed we have abandoned some of this or called it liberal. Some of this may be liberal, but it was also ours. For the protection of the working classes, the German Social Democratic Party demands, first of all, effective national and international worker protection laws on the following principle. 
Fixing the working day to not exceed eight hours. Prohibition of gainful employment of children under the age of 14. That's a lot of marks. Prohibition of night work except for those industries that require night work for inherent technical reasons or for reasons of public welfare services. An uninterrupted rest period of at least 36 hours every week for every worker. That actually seems a little bit under ambitious now. The prohibition of the truck system. I, I will need to look up what that is. Supervision of all industrial est establishments, investigation, and regulation of working conditions in the cities and the countryside by a Reich Labor Department, district labor bureaus, and chambers of labor. Rigorous industrial hygiene. Legal equity of agricultural laborers and domestic service with industrial workers. Abolition of laws governing domestics. So services are treated as proletarian. And again, people, a lot of stupid arguments would be cleared up if people looked at what historically we believed the Engel signed off on. Safeguarding the freedom of association. Takeover by the right government of the entire system of workers insurance with decisive participation by the workers in its administration. So the workers insurance program should be run by the workers themselves. There should be no indirect taxation. Especially if it advantages one part of the class above others. A lot of this today seems pretty liberal. Now, we're going to get to the critique of the draft that of effort. And again, it's important to remember some of the language I think it's critiquing gets removed. But let's go to the historical context, The Lessons of Erfurt by Mac McNair, which I think is a pretty good essay. I don't always agree with Mike McNair's political conclusions, but I think as a historian, he is top notch. This link will also be provided in the show notes. The program, or Lessons of Effort, was the second international based on the parties of the whole class. Mike Manero looks at the real history of working class organization. The Effort program was adopted in, 19, in 1891 by the Social Democratic Party of Germany. It is famous or notorious, depending on your point of view, for its division into a maximum part, the ultimate aims, and a minimum part, the immediate demands. Something that I still defend, actually. I don't think this was a bad uh framework even though it doesn't explicitly call that this article is not about the approximate origins or detail of the effort program rather it's about the parties and programs in longer view what is the background to socialist part uh, building a party around the program of the effort type we have to start for this purpose with the origins of political parties in the modern sense this goes back to the years 1679 to 18 i mean to 1683 in england which is true. I tend to find that the party started in England too. There was a crisis of the restored monarchical regime and an opposition to it, which was looking for a constitutional government in some sense came to into being. Its opponent gave its name as intended as an insult. They described it as the party or the Whigamores, which meant the Scottish Presbyterian rebels shortened to the Whigs. The Whigs retaliated against their opponents, calling themselves for the supporters of the king and the church, referred to them as the Tory party, a Tory meaning Irish Catholic rebels. So this is basically, are you Catholic or are you Scottish is the origins. So Whig and Tory are both insults in origin, like many things that we call ourselves. The Whigs were largely suppressed from 1681, and the Tories were in ascendant until 1687. Then they refused to accept James II's policies of Catholics taking positions in the army and the University of Oxford. These policies sent Tories into opposition even though they were called Catholic rebels. James II, briefly and without much success, tried to bring the Whigs on board, but the end was in 18, uh, 1688 and the Glorious Revolution. The period between 1688 and, 17, and 1714 were referred to as the time as a period of the rage of party. General elections held every three years and many more of them contested in parliamentary seats. From this period, the Whig and Tory parties became more or less established parliamentary and election campaigning groups and names ceased to be mere insults. How were these parties organized? These were parliamentary caucuses. The existence of the parliamentary parties as an ideological formation has been disputed, but recent historical work has tended to reaffirm that there really were parliamentary parties that voted in bloc. They were London party clubs like the Whig Kit Kat Club or the Tory October Club in the early 18th century, or the Tory Carlton Club and the Liberal Reform Club in the 19th. 
and there were local clubs and societies and the parliamentary constituencies. They were vague ideological attachments to liberty for Whigs, to church and king for Tories, but no definitive political platform, kind of like the Democrats and Republicans today. They have platforms and planks, but they're not really definitive. They're very loose. This very loose type of party organization continues to exist, exactly, and the Republican and Democratic Party today in the United States, and the Tory party still shows some remnant features, but it would gradually be superseded with the coming into the existence of parties like the SPA Day, which had organized membership, conferences, and political platform, which we don't have in the United States, except in sectarian parties, which aren't parties in the proper sense. They're sectarian groups. All right. This loose structure was combined in the sense that continued into the 19th century, underlying the illegitimacy of political parties. You see this in the United States. That it would be better if the political classes, meaning the property classes, were all united into a uniform point of view. The idea that the party was an insult persisted in political discourse. There's actually a worthwhile and provocative article by Chris Catrone, Lenin's Liberalism, on Platypus's website, where Catrone argues that the idea of the illegitimacy of political differences persisted into the workers' movement, and that Lenin helped legitimize such differences with the split in 1903. From sect to workers' party. The workers' movement in the early 19th century was characterized by the, dominant of what was widely, by the dominance of what was widely known as sex. They were called sects because they arose as a result of individuals writing long theoretical books attaching a group of adherents. So in England, there were the Owenites based on Robert Owen's ideas, the Paynites based on Thomas Paine's ideas, the Spencean communists based on Thomas Spence's ideas, and so on. In France, there were the San Simonians, the Fourierists, and from late 1940 uh, and and from the late 1840s on Prodonists, Blanquist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so on. The new idea of workers' political movements founded on a short summary of the statement and principles began in 1838 with the Chartism and the six points of the People's Charter. I vote for every man over the age of 21, secret ballot, no property qualifications for membership of parliament, payment for in peace, so poor men can sub, constituencies of equal size, annual elections. By the way, the, the, that's why not paying representatives, what well, you sometimes hear as like a populist move, is actually bad. <laughs> Chartism as a movement remained half within the tradition of the British political parties like the Whigs and the Tories. It consisted of local organizations loosely tied together, but unified by the goals of the Charter. Ingalls' socialism, utopian and scientific, offers a narrative of a passage from utopian socialism through Hegel's philosophy of history of human evolution to historical materialism grounded in the political economic analysis and class. Karl Kotsky, I think it's Kotsky, actually. I think I often misfit it. Uh, in 1908, rendered this narrative into the idea of Marxism comes from the, unif the, unif the Union of the German Philosophy, English Political Economy, and French Socialism. I was told this too. Lenin, in turn, developed the ideas of Kosky further in his three sources and three component parts of Marxism in 1913, a text that will one day cover. There is an unfortunate gap in both these texts caused by Kosky's belief that in 1908, the British politics were already in the 1830s and 40s dominated by compromise and pragmatism. The fundamental influence of Chartism on Marx and Engels' political ideas has gone missing. Chartism was already a guide in light for Marx and Engels in 1846, when the German Democratic Communists of Brussels congratulated Fergus O'Connor on his election to Chartist MP in July of 1846. Engels wrote towards the end of Chapter 2 of use, uh, Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific, quote, Already much earlier, certain historical facts had occurred, which led to the decisive change in the conception of history in 18. 31, the first working class rising took place in Lyon. Between 1838 and 1842, the first national working class movement, that of the English Chartist, reached its height. And in 1892, the English introduction. During the reform agitation, the working men constituted the radical Whig wing of the Reform Party. The act of 1832 having excluded them from suffrage, they formulated their demands in the People's Charter and constituted themselves in opposition to the great bourgeois of the Anti-Corn Law Party into an independent party, the Chartist, 
the first working men's party of modern times. From the Chartists, Marx and Engels attained two ideas which are really fundamental to their politics. One, that the working class needs to be organized for political power in the form of radical democracy. I'm not sure that they're always sold on that, but I would say mostly they're sold on that. And two, the idea of the workers' movement, which is founded on a short statement of principles. The Communist Manifesto is a different sort of entity. It conceives the Communists as part of the organized Chartist movement, not a separate party, a part whose role is expressed in the following statement. The Communists are distinguished from other working class parties by only this. One, in national struggles of the proletarian of different countries, they point out and bring to the front the common interest of the entire proletariat, independently of all nationality. Cough, cough. Two, the various stages of development which the struggle of the working class against the bourgeois has passed through, they always and everywhere represent the interest of the movement as a whole. This conception means that the manifesto contains a description of the historical context which the workers' movement appears and the polemic against various forms of sect, against feudal and bourgeois socialisms, and so on. Even so, towards the end, of the, towards the end there is a general statement of the measure which the working class would need to undertake power and power in order to transform society. Another version containing the political program derived from the charter plus the anti-federal policy of the French Revolution, together with the social and economic demands as provided by the 1848 demands of the Communist Party in Germany, unlike the manifesto, but like the charter, demands are merely bullet point lists without overarching goals. We also see this in some of the other early programs. In 1848 to 1849, the British state smashed the Chartism by repression, as it is detailed in John Savile's 1848, the British state and the Chartist movement, Cambridge 1990. At the same time, or slightly later, the revolutions of 1848 in France, Germany, and so on were defeated. Marx and Engels went into exile. The Communist League, the organization founded on the basis of the Communist Manifesto, fell apart politically. The First International. The First International Working Men's Association, the IWA, or the First International was founded in 1864, was a very different project. It started with an actually existing political movement, the solidarity of the British workers with the, Nor with the North and the North American Civil and the American Civil War, excuse me, uh, and arising out of that solidarity, the effort to set up a movement in solidarity with Polish national movement on the basis of the First International was formed. The First International was not a party founded on a platform. It was an organization based on immediate practical solidarity on an international level. But there were also proposals that the working class organizations of all political shades should get together and organize and discuss what working class policy should be. That is what the international actually did. It engaged in practical solidarity work. The General Council did far more in a way of appeals for practical solidarity in relations to strikes in various parts of Europe than either the Bureau of the Second International or the International Executive Committee of the Communist International, the Third International, or common turn. But it was also an organization which discussed the working class policy should be in relation to land, education, and questions of nationality, and so on. The International broke up because it was wish hunted after the Paris Commune. The Perdonis in France, who were a substantial component of it, were smashed by executions, exile, and imprisonment. The British trade union leaders took fright from the Commune, but on the other side of the coin was the Reform Act of 1867 and the Trade Union Act of 1871, which enabled the bourgeois parties to claim that they could do something for the working class. At the same time, there was a split between those who sided with sided with Marx and the Bakuninist. The Bakuninist argued for immediate abolition of the state and the introduction of communal anarchy. Their conduct led to a split that they insisted that the international should be a broad front with a revolutionary Bakuninist minority, which organized secretly within it. Well, that's what Marx accused him of anyway. Um, this is more contested. See uh, the first socialist schism and uh, read about it. That this is a highly contested part of socialist history, and I just want to put out the contest there. There were two other projects going on at the same time in Germany. Germany. One was the General Association of the German Workers, the ADAV, initially organized by Ferdinand Lasalle in 1863. The ADAV, as we've talked about before, was not a Chartist or an 1848-style Communist Party committed to a political democracy. When it founded, it adopted a, its platform on a 40-page article by LaSalle, The Open Letter. 
In spite of its length, this document proposed the idea of a workers' party independent of the liberals and on the basis of two demands only, universal suffrage and state-supported producer cooperatives. The rest of the text was a theoretical argument principally on the iron law of rages, which was Methusian and Marx hated it. The ADAV operated on what Lasallians called democratic centralism. That's where it comes from, by the way. By this, they meant that a Congress elected a leader, Democratic first LaSalle, then Schweitzer, after LaSalle was killed in a duel, and that the leader had dictatorial powers, centrist over party organization, and equally over trade unions, which were later founded in association with the party organization. So democratic centralism begins with LaSalle, not even Wachowski. In addition, LaSalle and after him Schweitzer, Fight, sir. We're happy to say that the working class could ally with Bismarck and the Prussian monarchists against the liberals because the liberals represented the capitalist class, where the monarchists were prepared to make social concessions to the working class, aka corporatism in the old sense of the word. The second project was that of the Eisnach Party. This was started with Wilhelm Liebknecht attempting to organize an opposition within the Lasallian AVAD in Berlin, but Bismarck, hearing of this, had Liebknecht deported from Prussia to Saxony. Liebknecht went into, went into the Saxon Liberal Party, called the Folks Party, the People's Party, and organized the left tendency within it in a process winning August Babel. In 1869, the tendency fused with the split from the ADAV and thus created the Social Democratic Workers' Party, or Eisenach Party. This was not quite a formal party. This organization was based on a clear platform, the Eisenach Program, which I guess we need to talk about someday, which had six general principles and set out some specific demands. The gen oh, well, I don't have to talk about it because we're going to talk about it in this. The general principles were the current and political social conditions are extremely undust and thus have to be combated with the utmost industry. Two, the struggle for liberation of the working class is not a struggle for class privileges and special rights, but of equal rights and obligations and for the abolition of class rule. Class abolition has been there from early on. Three, the economic dependency of the worker on the capitalist constitutes the basis of any form of servitude. Uh, I don't think that's true, but whatever. And therefore, the Social Democratic Workers' Party aims for each worker to get the full earnings through labor through a cooperative system concomitant to this abolition of the current method of production, the wage system. You can see this Lasallian holdover. Four. Political freedom represents the most essential precondition for the economic liberation of the laboring classes. Consequently, the social question is inseparable from the political one. Take that, anti-political Marxist. Its solution is conditional on the latter and only possible in a democratic state. So you can't have anti-politics until you have taken care of politics. Considering that the political and economic liberation of the working class is only possible if the struggle under current uh, conducted under common unified principles, the Social Democratic Workers Party is adopting uh, a unified organization, which nevertheless allows for each individual member to assert their influence for the general welfare. This is our version of democratic socialism, kind of. Considering that the liberation of labor is neither local nor national, but rather social task encompassing all countries with a modern form of society, the Social Democratic Workers Party regards itself to the extent that the associated laws permit as a branch of the Workers International Association and is affiliated with the efforts of that body. It's important to be clear that the ASNAP program has within it most of the faults which Marx criticized in the Goethe program. Indeed, Bakunin wrote a critique of the Asnot program, parts of which Marx plagiarized in the critique of the Goethe program. Okay, that's a big admit, admission from our friend, uh, Professor McNair, Dr. McNair. At the same time, the concept of the Asnot program is the same as the concept uh, as that of the Charter or the demands of the Communist Party in Germany. It is a departure in the sense from the first international idea of a general association, which does not have a definitive program, but provides a framework from which the working class can discuss what its policy ought to be and return to the idea of a workers' 
political movement founded on a short, clear political platform. Between 1869 and 1875, the main political event was the Franco-Prussian War. Babel and Liebknecht, who had been elected to the Parliament of the North German Confederation as the Eisenach MPs, refused, against the advice of Marx and Engels, to vote for credits for the Prussian War effort. The ADAV, in contrast, gave clear support for the Prussian War effort. Babel and Liebknecht's decision was, retro was retrospectively validated by the military victories of the Prussians and also by the fact that the Prussians turned out to be annexationists, seizing Ensemble Saint-Laurent. In respect, the two were seen as to have made an enormous stand on principle against the Prussian military aggression. At the same time, the, organ the organizers of the trade unions under the framework of the ABA ADAV were becoming increasingly opposed to the system under which Schweitzer, as the elected leader, was simultaneously the president of every trade union associated with the ABAD. There was also an opposition to the fact that Schweitzer had the right to intervene in local parties, appoint their organizers, and even dissolve them. In contrast with the Eisenachers, who regarded the affected autonomy of the branch, trade unions, and so on, were being fundamentally part of their political conception, and the working class needs political democracy. And that implied that the creativity in localities and branch and so on. This is all very explicit in the Eisenach program. By the way, this is something I think Marxists lose, lose the narrative on in the 20th century. Why that we've always supported some centralization. Um, we did not regard it as overriding all local autonomy historically. And for good reason. The result of these developments were not only further splits from the Lasallians towards the Eisenachers, but also pressure for unification of the two organizations. Goethe. The Goethe in 1875, the two organizations unified on the basis of the Goethe program. Marx's critique of the Goethe program more or less says that the non-Marxist content of this program resulted from William Leibniz, William Leibniz's concessions to the Lasallians. Asterisk. You should read the text, the Manifesto of Goethe, for an example of Leibniz's concessions. This is kind of what Leibniz seems to have been, even though he's a hero later on, <laughs> well, he kind of gets sidelined in uh, Erfurt. But in fact, the Goethe program was completely drafted by Leibniz. That's funny. The Goethe program is a step further forward relative to the Osnot program in that it does two things. Again, it's a short document. It begins with a short statement of principles to which Marx addressed most to which most of Marx's critique is addressed. Yeah, Marx didn't agree with the principles. Well, let's read it. We've read it before. One, labor is the source of all wealth and all culture, since uh, and since universal productive labor is only possible through society, therefore to society, that is to all of its members, belongs to the collective product of labor. With the universal obligation of labor, according to equal justice, each should have proportion to his reasonable needs. In the present society, the means of labor are a monopoly of the capitalist class. The servitude of the laboring classes with its outgrowth of this is the cause of misery and slavery in all its forms. The liberation of labor demands the transformation of the means of production of the common property of society in the association of regulation of collective labor with the general employment and just distribution of the proceeds of labor. We already saw this in the Asner program. The emancipation of labor must be the working must be of the laboring classes as opposed to which all other classes are only a reactionary body. Uh, Marx actually critiques that for being too far. Proceeding from this principle, the Socialist Labor Party of Germany seeks throughout all legal means to the means of free state in the social society, destruction of the iron law of rages, the overthrow of exploitation of all forms, and the abolition of all social and political inequity. The Socialist Labor Party of Germany, through working chiefly in national boundaries, is conscious of the international character of the labor movement and is resolved to fulfill every duty which is laid upon the workers in order to realize the brotherhood of humanity. The Socialist Labor Party of Germany demands a, uh, as a step to the solution of the social question, the erection with the help of the state of socialist and productive establishments of the democratic control of the laboring people, uh, the Richard Wolff program, as I would call it today. These productive establishments are to place industry and agriculture in such relations that out of them, the socialist organization of the whole may arise. Then comes the section of political demands as the foundation of the state, and finally the section of demands within the present society, which is largely addressed to the media situation. 
here, in a sense, is the beginning of the of the idea of having a, a minimum program and a, ma a maximum program and a minimum program, although it's not clearly stated. There's a separation between overall aims, the political element of the program, and the social reform demands tailored to the immediate circumstances. The overall aims add to the immediate demands in politics and economics, the element of inspiration, the add that to the social reform tag, another world is possible. In spite of what is said in the critique of the Goethe program, the unification of the Eisnacht Party and the ADAB created a snowball effect. The German socialist group was not so large, about 12,000 in the ADAB and about 7,000 in the Eisenachers. They're both relative sects, actually. But within a, few within a few years, the United Party reached hundreds of thousands of members. The snowball effect of unification is equally true in relation to the history of the Second International in general. In 1889, the Hainfield program of the Austrian Social Democracy was a fusion program. The Italian Socialist Party, the French section of Francois de Internal Ovier, uh, the, the French section of the French International Left, and the Russian Social Democratic and Labor Party all originated as a fusion of a number of different groups. This created a unified organization that enables it to advance massively compared to the disunified forces which existed beforehand. This is why there's a focus on left unity from neo kalskyites and uh, social Republicans. We have seen this phenomenon again more recently, even if it's taken on a less principled basis uh, in the Brazilian Workers' Party, PT, the Radofon de Zon Communistas opening up to the forces of the left, in the Scottish Socialist Party, in the left bloc, in Portugal, and the Red Green Alliance in Denmark, the unification of relatively small factions of socialism in itself creates a different dynamic. They also dissolve when they don't work, though. If we ask ourselves why that should be so, the answer is actually perfectly obvious. The working class as a class has a profound interest in unified action in spite of political differences. I'd agree with that. Because without a framework for united action among people who have political differences, you cannot organize a strike, you cannot form trade unions, credit unions, or cooperatives. The working class objectively needs unity. Hence, insofar as the left sets up itself in favor of purity, it takes us back to the times before Chartism, and we're all forced to give... Comp <laughs> we are forced to give all competing tendencies the name of their theoretical leaders. Do we still kind of do this? Just take just Britain, the Cliffites, the Mandalites, the Heliites, the Mag the Magnites, etc., like the Painites, the Spensians, the Owenites, etc. So basically, you know, party left party. <laughs> the next step forward for the pro for program is the program of the party Ovier, the French Workers' Party. Okay. I was mistranslating that. Don't speak French, so it's the workers' party. The preamble drafted by Marx simply states that considering the emancipation of the productive class of all human beings without distinction of sex or race, the production can be free only when they are in possession. The producers can be free only if they are in possession of the means of production. There are only two forms in which the means of production can belong to them. The individual form, which never existed in a general state and which is increasingly eliminated by industrial progress. In the collective form, the material and, and intellectual elements of which are constituted by the develop, very development of capitalist society. Considering that this collective appropriation can only rise from revolutionary action from the productive classes of the proletariat organized in, in a distinct political party. That such organization must be pursued by all means the proletariat has at its disposal, including universal suffrage, which will thus be transformed in an instrument of deception that has been until now an instrument of emancipation. This short statement of the general aim is followed by a section on political demands, quite similar to those of Goethe, and an ad hoc collection of immediate economic and social demands. The organization framework of the PO program is, that, is thus that of the Goethe program. The introductory part is much more general. Its character is still within the framework of the charter. The working class needs political power and pursues that aim by laying the collective hands on the means of production, the fact that the working class aims for political power means it has to be thoroughly democratic in its political orientation. It is in the context of this program that Marx seems, in correspondence, to have coined the phrase minimum program, bring about together the political section and the section of immediate demands. In the 1888-1889, 
the Austrian Social Democratic Putin's unified on the basis of the Hanfeld program. The design and length is broadly the same. The Hanfeld also brings a LinkedIn version of the general principles from the program of the party OVA. OVA, um, I think. I'm even worse at French than German. Erfurt. After the legalization of the SPD day in Germany, there was felt to be a need to revise the Goethe program. Germany had changed an enormous in the period of time since its formulation. There have been major industrializations, there have been large state welfare institutions, and so on. Germany had begun to be an imperial power. And again, William Liebnick, oh, wrote the draft of the Erfurt program. Ingalls was fairly sharp critique of it, regarding it as a step forward from the Goethe program, but not much more. There was in discussions with the STV executive, which result called Kafti, Karl Kowski drafted the introductory section. The whole program is still pretty short, though the introduction is longer than any previous version. It is followed, as in Goethe and in the Party of VA programs, with the political section and the economic social section. Ingalls criticized Liebnick's first draft, amongst other things, for failing to demand a republic, though he had admitted. It would seem that from the legal point of view, it is inadvisable to include a demand for a republic directly in the program. He suggested the concentration of all political power in the hands of people's representatives and complete self-government in the provinces, districts, and communes through, elected, through officials elected by universal suffrage and the abolition of all local and provincial authorities appointed by the state. The final version used a, a vision, a version of the second formula, self-determination and self-governments of the people in the Reich, state and province and municipality election by a people of magistrates who are answerable and liable to them. Just for a complete issue, we could look roughly three pages of the program of the Russian Social Democratic and Labor Party adopted in 1903. The explanatory part is a bit longer than the effort, but the specific demands are, and the specific demands are more extensive. They are again divided in political economic. The latter are a very different character because of a different situation of Tsarist Russia, but they are longer and much more detailed. The basic character. What is to be drawn from this history? To start with, the whole idea of the Second International was a movement of the whole class is quite false. The First International was itself conceived as a movement of the whole class, which was then worked out as politics through discussion. But the Second Internationalist parties were political parties founded on the basis of a definite political platform. And this definite political platform first excluded the anarchists by insisting on the political action of the working class. Uh, I... I actually think while I would insist on political action of the working class, I would not have excluded the anarchist. And second, when the Lasallian signed up to the Goethe program, contrary to what Marx said in the critique, they broke with the labor monarchism of Lasall and Schweitzer and their labor dictator, centralism in their party organization, although it was to come back later, and adopted the idea that the proletariat had an interest in political democracy, which is a line of the Charter Communist Manifesto and Osnock program. So in spite of Liebknecht's muddled theoretical explanations, it was, a, it was the Salians that gave up the most in the, in the Goethe unification. The program therefore forms a definite, a definite political conception. The working class has to take control of the means of production and to do so by taking power. To take political power, it means political democracy. There follow a common body of political demands Attached to the basic idea as a set of current economic and social demands of some sort or another, this conception of the party and conception of the program, which derives ultimately from the charter. The result has been substantially more complex, and indeed party programs of this type have become longer. Partly, they do so just as a product of political experience, and the working class is contesting elections, all the more when it is represented in parliament, the Workers' Party and representatives are forced to take positions on current policy debates. But the very elementary conception is that of a program for political power. The working class needs a political democracy as a means of its own emancipation, and on the road to the emancipation of all human beings without regard to sex or race, that the working class aims to take power in order to supersede itself, that it has to take collective control of the means of production. This elementary idea turns out to be the engine for the creation of enormous mass socialist parties, which we saw in the beginning of the 20th century, but haven't really seen since then. <laughs> um, uh, and an even broader mass socialist sentiment. And it is the existence of those mass socialist parties and the mass socialist system across most of Europe that made possible the question of the working class actually taking power to be posed in 1918, 1916 to 1918. So this is where political first Marxism comes from, that you need the politics for the 
for the workers' movement to glom onto, not for the politics to emerge out of the workers' movement. Although you can you can see that McNair does see the problems of over-centralization. Um, he also sees the problems of of undemocratic sectarian groups, or you know, which are democracies of very small groups of people, uh, which then try to force their politics on everybody else later. Anyway. Without the working class political organization and effective unity for this project, the class becomes conscious of its own strength and hence the possibility of taking power. The question of actually taking power cannot, in fact, have been posed. Yeah, although I do think there is concessions to the Lestalians have long term traits. For example, democratic centralism was an operating principle within the SP day, and it becomes more and more from the Leibniz conception of it to the conception of kind of subordination to the leadership of the party itself later on, particularly in the context of later civil wars. And after the civil wars, those restrictions are not released. Anyway, the conception of program and party, which stems from the charter through the through the 1848 demands and the Eisenhower program, the Goethe program, the French party OVA program, the Afro program and its imitators across Europe is, I think, a lesson to the present day left needs to pay serious attention. Mike Metnair. All right. This is context for our discussion of Engel's critique of Liebknecht and then, you know, the Babel, Kotsky, Bernstein draft, uh, which is, you know, added on. We can see, even in the Eisenach program, that some of the Lasallian stuff comes in from Liebnik himself. Hero of the party, though he is. Communist, though he is. Against the right wing of his own party. We see also concessions to the right wing early on. It actually is weird that he's one of the people that goes down with Luxembourg, ultimately. That's a history I'm going to have to explore later. I'm not sure. I understand it. Like and subscribe. Hit the bell. We have a Patreon. You can get it for a little three dollars and get audio versions of all this if you don't want to watch my stupid face. Um, I have other things, and you get more. There's sub shows. There's more history discussions. We do all kinds of stuff there. You're gonna see me cover a lot more anarchist and uh, Kalskiite and left communist and classical communist text here you'll notice that nailing it down is going to be alternating between exploring the classical text of socialism probably going to focus more on these key texts here and uh in addition to other just teaching things about logic or whatever nailing it down is a broad project and radical engagement is going to be engaging with stuff from the 20th century and contemporary stuff to kind of actually have debates Admittedly one-sided because I'm just reading, writing, and responding to it as if I was writing letters or notes to the editor or whatever. But that's what you're going to get. But I'm going to make sure that you have as much context as you can get because I'm kind of tired of stuff being glossed poorly and people not understanding history and that misunderstanding being even repeated in academic text. I can't stand it. And every fucking Communism 101 podcast does it. I want to put a kibosh on that shit. That's why we're here. And I want to be as fair as possible, including the tendencies that I don't necessarily like. Okay? Okay. Good. I hope you continue to nail it down with me and keep on building a better tomorrow and protect your peace. Have a great day and stay strong. Another world is possible, but you got to make it. Mm -hmm.